There we go. Got it. Hey, Allison, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. We're kind of rounding. I think we're like rounding towards home. <laughs> so it's exciting. Yeah. It's a little stressful, but it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How's everything going for you? Good. I don't actually have a lot to do for the end of the year. That's, are you happy about that? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> That's very good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I feel like I have people who trickle in occasionally later. So I'll just, oh, and I will put the link to the Pear Deck in the chat. And then I know I have the link to the Pear Deck on that email I sent out already. Okay, so I'm going to put that there. I'm pretty excited about the animated short for this week. Um, it's just, it's precious. So I'm pretty excited to get into it. All right, so I'm going to come back over here and I need, I need to turn on the closed captions and we'll see how long I can get it to stay on for. Okay, so we are going to do a check-in. We're going to do a week 16 overview and I just wanna do a quick reminder about maps testing. And then I want to review op, author's purpose and um, we'll consider author's purpose and identity in Kit Bowl. It's an animated short created by Pixar. Um, they have a series called Spark Shorts. Um, so this is part of that series. Kitbull was nominated for an Academy Award in 2020. It lost to Hair Love, which is the one we watched in week 14. Um, but it's, I feel like it probably was a really tough call because this is a really good animated short. Okay, and so we are thinking about purpose. And when I think about purpose, I think about direction. And so I have the compass because we would wanna think about, well, what, what gives us direction, right? And it's probably our, um, our values, our moral system is what's going to be our, our compass. And so we're gonna look at how we see values and that moral slash value system emerge in, in an animated short or in a text. Okay, so that's kind of like what I was thinking with the compass. Okay, so I'm kind of curious, how are you today? Are you in the red quadrant, the blue, the green or the yellow? And you can put it in the pear deck. I have the pear deck open also, so I'm gonna do it too. And here, I'm just gonna do, oopsies. I'm gonna come over here just because it's fun. I'm in the green. And so <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna keep going. You can just think about it also, that's fine. Here we go. And this, so um, I asked this question to my middle, my middle schoolers just because I do feel like there are all kinds of feelings associated with the end of the year. And it, um, you know, when you think about the end of the year, it might trigger a feeling. And so I'm kind of curious how you feel like specifically about the end of the year. And then I just want to do a quick reminder. I'm going to turn this back on. Let's see. So our last day to turn in regular coursework is May 28th. And the last day to turn in your final exam is June 4th. And if you need help, just let me know and I will work with you. I am more than willing to be flexible. And so I'm curious, how are you feeling about the end of the year? My middle schoolers, because I teach middle school reading, so it's a primarily a sixth grade class. I had so many say they were stressed and so many say they were tired. It was sad. And then I had some people who said they were sad that they love school and I thought that was so sweet. So I'm just curious. And of course, you know, you could be something totally different. And then, you know, some of, I don't know if anybody actually chose optimistic. Um, because you know they felt like they were um, finishing strong. I actually don't think anybody chose that one. And I, you know, it's kind of interesting because I feel like in sixth grade, it's a different perception of school. So a little, or you know, it's just like you you have different workloads. It's not necessarily a different perception of school, but I just I feel like the stakes are not as high in sixth grade. And so um, I was kind of sad that I didn't see any of those um, optimistic. Okay, so, and hopefully, you know what, I feel like the stakes, the stakes, um, those pressures relate to like final exams and that push at the end of the year. Um, and maybe that has been lessened here, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. So here's our week 16 overview. 
So we are in this last week of reading for Unit 4 Identity. So we, you would complete your reading choice or, you know, whatever. If you're reading the extended, which I know you are, so you would finish it. And then if you're reading short stories, you would um, read the last of your, you would read your last choice regarding the short stories. And then we have, um, I'm going to focus on T1 author's purpose this week. So that's the last one that I'm going to look at. And I have all the reading options here. Here's a link to the discussion board for T1 author's purpose. And of course, if you, I know I have some students who are uncomfortable for posting to the discussion board. And if that is a, if that it feels like a barrier to you, just email me your work. I would prefer to see the work than um, have you not do it out of that fear. So I totally understand that. And then here is T1 Tell Your Story, which is due in week 17. Okay. And map testing. So Mrs. Burns made this beautiful graphic for map testing and I asked her permission if I could use it and she said yes, which I am so grateful for. Um, so we have map testing on Monday and Tuesday. So yesterday was a window and today is a window and the window is open from nine to one. So this is for your reading map test. And then tomorrow and Thursday, you have your map map test. And so Thursday is the makeup day. So two days to take your map test. And if you're struggling, please let me know. We will, we can work something out. Okay, so now we're gonna revisit this graphic that we used in week seven and eight to refresh our memories about what, what is author's purpose um, because we are going to be connecting it to how does it, how does it work with identity? And so when we consider author's purpose, it's important because author's purpose will inform author's choice. And so they're going to choose certain directions with their elements of craft. And so that would include mood, tone, diction, imagery, figurative language, um, just any of those elements of craft, structuring, um, sequence, um, I guess what, what image rich details they would include, those are all going to work into their purpose. Um, for example, you know, if they were choosing to inform, you know, which is to teach or give information to the reader, they might focus on just very concrete uh, physical details because they're just trying to communicate information. Whereas if they're trying to persuade and they want to convince the reader to a certain point of view, they might use inflammatory language because they're trying to get you riled up about something, you know, so that you would be persuaded to see their viewpoint. They might include um, emotional anecdotes um, because that is also going to work to persuade you. So there's a number of ways that an author can work to persuade, um, but it is going to impact how they write a piece. And then similarly with entertaining, um, this would be, of course, you know, how an author what an author perceives to be entertaining. So what would hold the reader's attention through enjoyment? So whether it be through, um, you know, some kind of heart-wrenching story or comedy or something suspenseful. Um, so all those, those elements of purpose are really important because they infuse craft. And then craft, of course, are all those things that go into writing a piece. Okay, so just as a quick reveal, male tigers. Oh, so we're gonna look at, you know, we can see the variation between two different pieces depending on purpose. So, oops, I forgot to put my quotation marks. So, you know, if I were, if this was in my writing, male tigers weigh 200 to 600 pounds, I think we can infer what the purpose is. Is the purpose to persuade, inform, entertain, or trick? I'm just going to give it a second. And then you can, you can just think about it. You can put it in the chat, whatever you want. And so I'm going to come over here. And I will look at it also. You know what? I'm on the wrong one. There we go. There we go. So I think it's clearly in form, right? It's very clear cut, very objective, really just communicates physical attributes without, um, without inserting any opinion. So we know it's to inform. So this is important to note how objectivity and subjectivity tie into author's purpose. And we focused on that concept in week 11. So the more objective um, a piece is, you might say, well, it's probably in form, although it really depends, you know, it really depends on what their purpose is. If an author feels like the objective information will just by its nature persuade the reader, um, the piece might be full of objective information. So it's really important to consider, um, we would consider the author's, um, I guess you could say his point of view, um, the stance, 
are they making an argument for anything? Okay, so let's keep going. And, you know, if we were to look at, oh, I can do it from here. If we were to look at this one, you know, so we have a whole thriving industry on um, advertising. And so, you know, why would an author write a commercial for Disney World? Is it to persuade you to go there, to inform you that it is real, to entertain you at home or to trick you? This one's obvious, but it's, it would be to persuade you, right? So all of these things we see around us, whether they, um, in advertising, whether they seem like it or not, are intended to be persuasive. And so through like this vast, um, the vast types of advertisements we have, we know that persuading can look very different, right? There's no one set method. It's not always like, oh, I'm gonna tell you a story or it's not always, I'm going to make it look super exciting. It's, there's so many different ways you can work to persuade someone. Okay, so I'm gonna come down here. Now we have Kit Bull. Okay, so um, this is, we're gonna consider how author's purpose coincides with identity using Kit Bull, which is a Pixar spark short. Here are our discussion board questions. So I wanted to read them in advance and we would think about, okay, what do we think is the author's purpose for writing this piece? I'm gonna turn that on, let's see. Okay, and oh, look how funny it looks now. That's okay. All right, so what do we think is the author's purpose for writing this piece? How does purpose relate to identity? Now, I think on first glance, you might be like, I don't know that that connects. But then when I was thinking it through, I realized that our theme, whatever the theme is, um, or multiple themes, those speak to universal truths. And it's likely that those universal truths that an author might design to be present in a text speaks to what the author values. And values are a core part of identity. So I see that overlap there. So we're gonna think about the theme and we're gonna tie it into identity. And then we would want to use details and a specific quote or specific evidence from the reading to support your response. And then we're going to connect it more um, societally. So think about the world around you. Why is the author's message important today? Use an example from society for support. Okay, so this is our animated short. And um, the animation, I think it is called 2D animation. It's not the Pixar, traditional Pixar, you know, where it's like those um, 3D figurines. Um, so it's kind of like that old school animation. So I do want to make a note. This short does hint at dog fighting. It does not show any violent images, but it does show um, it does show the injuries a dog sustained afterwards. We don't see the fight or anything like that, but we see how the dog is scratched, scratched up and injured, and it's it is sad. Um, but it just the resolves so beautifully. So just stick with it. Okay, here we go. And I'm going to try to maximize it if I can. Maybe it will let me. I don't know. There we go. No, it didn't do it. Let's see. There. Okay, now I did it. I did it. Yeah.
Okay, that's the whole short. It's so cute. Okay, I do see some clear, I see some big theme ideas there. I think they're really powerful. Um, okay, it's a tearjerker. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, now when we look at it, I have a personal connection. Um, my um, my aunt lives in Texas and um, she lives in a small town. It's I think it's kind of like two hours south east of Dallas. And um, she came across an injured pit bull. And um, the pit bull, I think they had just popped up in her yard, um, but the pit bull was um, kind of injured like the one in this short. And um, she and her husband are real dog lovers. So they took, they took the pit bull in and, you know, I think even though they already had three dogs or so, um, but that they, so the pit bull, they, you know, they nurtured it, they um, helped it recover. And um, they, the pit bull loves, loves my aunt and uncle, but the pit bull, um, she does not do well with other dogs or other adults or other people. And their speculation is that the pit bull was escaping a home where dog fighting was encouraged. Um, so those experiences, it's kind of incredible, but they, they leave marks on, on, um, on those animals. Um, but so she has a good home with my aunt and uncle, but this bit short makes me think of that situation. And of course we see so many resonant ideas um, in this short. I'm going to come over here because I have some questions. So when we think about, okay, what is our author's purpose? Let's think about how stereotypes or misconceptions hurt each character. And let's think about what each character might represent. And actually something else that I see emerging that I didn't even think about prior was what do our characters want? And I think that's going to lead to a theme idea because we see that Pipple and he wants he just wants love and affection from his owner, right? And then we see him trying to make a connection with the kitten and he wants family, he wants community. He wants people that he can um, be safe with. So I see that as another theme idea emerging. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna think about these questions. So I see, now I, I know we have some pretty, so um, pit bulls, so I'm just gonna maybe make some notes. So pit bulls, pit bulls are stereotyped, stereotyped to be dangerous um, dogs. And I know that there have been incidences of maybe a dog attack from a pit bull, but um, I do think that that is a stereotype that they are all uh, dangerous and that they are, you know, um, that they will attack and that they are, um, bred to fight. And so we have this stereotype there. Now there is a reality, there is a reality that dog fighting exists, um, but it does not mean that it is right. It does not mean that it is right. And so I also see, I see a lot here actually. So we see how um, the dog fighting and this man's desire for the pit bull to be a fighter how it strips the pit bull of who he is, his his or her individuality, which I know it's, I know we were thinking, I'm thinking more like metaphorical um, in terms of like how, how, what are the bigger implications here? And of course, you know, there's all this debate whether, um, I feel like, you know, there's a debate whether or not animals are on the same level as humans, but that's not really the, port here, the point here. We're thinking about, uh, you know, like what is the theme that emerges and, um, I see these bigger implications about how stereotypes strip away individuality and they pigeonhole, um, they pigeonhole the pit bull and they pigeonhole people. So stereotypes, um, let's see, strip away. They pigeonhole people, people, animals even, because we see it pigeonholing, we see it pigeonholing the, um, the pit bull an animal. So I'm going to leave that there. So we see, um, <clears throat> and then it, we, when we see that, um, uh, when we see them stripping away and pigeonholing, we also see a loss, right? Because I feel like the man lost on this potentially 
enriching relationship with the pit bull who was clearly affectionate, you know, just wanted to be responsive and loving. And so we see that loss. So there's, there isn't even an opportunity there. Um, and I think that's another powerful idea. So um, that, that we see loss with stereotype, if that makes sense. Oh, here, I'm gonna fix the spelling error. Okay. Okay, now I also think about, <clears throat> consider what each character might represent. And I feel like it's, it's, it represents um, people on the fringes or people in um, difficult situations. Oopsies, let me see. Could the, could the animals represent people on the fringes? I mean, let's see. So that to me means like um, people without people, right? So people without friends, people without um, a support community, friends without support. Is it, could this be potentially an allegory for, um, for bullying? You know, when we see, um, it's, it doesn't work perfectly, but we see the pit bull and he is clearly in need. Um, he, with the dog fighting, it puts him at risk. So it is not necessarily, I don't know that it's a perfect parallel with bullying, but we see him hurt. And then we see the cat, the cat doesn't necessarily, the cat intervenes, you know, but he gives the dog, he gives the pit bull love and acceptance. And then he motivates the pit bull to escape. So we also see, we also see how friendship and love can be motivating. And I'm gonna leave it at that, let me see. Okay, because, I better explain it. Because the kitten offers, offers love to the pit bull and encourages the pit bull to escape. So I have that. I'm not sure I did it justice, but it's okay because it's still in like brainstorm phase. And then, um, so I kind of answered those two questions. And then we would want to, you know what I think I, did I mess up? I might have, that's okay. Let me see, I didn't. Okay, so, okay, so down here, we would also then, we would think about what does the creator value? I see the creator valuing friendship the power of friendship really, uh oh, valuing the power of friendship. I see the creator valuing um, um, the security of being loved, being loved, but uh, for who he or she is. I see the creator valuing um, a helping hand. And we see the helping hand in the kitten and we see the helping hand again with the woman who coaxes the kitten and the pit bull out and then takes them in. Okay, and we see the creator valuing the power of, mm, the power of helping others in need. Yes, okay. And then, so I feel like that that does enough right now, even though I could, I really need to flush it out more and I need to polish up my writing and I probably need to put in more details, but it's okay because I have those ideas out. And then we would want to think about, okay, so I kind of already thought about it, but why is this author's message important today? And so we see, we see restoration with um, the pit bull and the kitten. I guess, I don't know if it's true restoration, but we see them being enmeshed in, in a family and how much that means to them. So we see, we see the kitten and the pit bull. We see the kitten and the pit bull enmeshed, enmeshed, or let's see, no, um, they are, ooh, the word is eluding me. I'm trying to think, what would be a good way to communicate this idea? Integrated, integrated into a family slash community. So I'm gonna pull it even bigger, right? We see how important community is. Uh, let's see, we see, and I feel like it speaks to stereotypes. So we see the danger of stereotypes. And I think 
and it promotes mm, awareness, right? Because awareness of others. Um, let's see, we should see, mm, we need to be able to see, you know, what others are going through. And if there is need for help, I think it's promoting the idea that others are called to help. I don't know. Yes, yes, perfect, accept it, I see it. Yeah, I think that's better. So, and I see a lot of different connections here. So I see the connection with the bullying. I see the connection with trying to pull in maybe um, hmm, like marginalized, marginalized people, you know, so like people who don't have support networks, how important it is to try to find community for them. At least that's what I'm seeing in this short animated short um, and how how let's see stereotypes can be damaging uh i think i think that that kind of gets it i would really need to support you know like i have my big idea but i don't have the evidence but i could work through the film and i could pick it out um so like if i were to prove this one we see the kid bull, the kitten and the pit bull accepted into a family or community i would probably i would probably open or i would probably develop my paragraph in terms of how they change so i'd say at the beginning um the kitten chooses to be isolated, runs away from people and tries to avoid the pit bull. Um, but after observing the pit bull and, um, you know, the pit bull, so the pit bull does not try to attack the kitten. The pit bull does not advance on the kitten. The pit bull basically respects the kitten's space and the need that the kitten has to be alone. And through that behavior gains the kitten's trust to the point where when the pit bull is in need, the kitten then goes to the pit bull. So we, I would, I see that evolution, and so that's how I would prove that point. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so we see, um, we see awareness. No, we see. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but we see the danger of stereotypes, and it promotes awareness of others. Uh, larger societal issues could potentially be larger societal issues could potentially connect to um, bullying, um, helping others in need, helping others in need, um, providing support for others, um, supporting um, marginalized groups, I guess. That's kind of what I see. And I don't know that I hit the right words, but it's, it's okay because it's just in draft stage. I could go back and I could really think through my structuring and my word choice. Okay, so look how cute. <laughs> the animation is just, I love the animation on the kitten. It's so expressive the way that they animated the fur. Okay, I'm gonna come over here. So this is just a three minute <clears throat> video on the making of Kit Bull. And they don't necessarily speak to themes. Oh, really? How cute. <laughs> okay, you must have, is it a black cat? We, yes, <laughs> my mom also has a black cat. And every time she visits, and we ask her to bring the kitten, the cat, because he's just so cute. And he, so he's older now, but um, he reminds me of the kitten and Kipple too. <laughs> oh, I know they're so cute. Okay, so um, on this making of Kipple, it's very interesting. So they don't necessarily speak to theme. But what she, what the main animator says about um, working with her team, I think is very telling. And I can see parallels between her experience and the themes present in Kit Bull. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it. I've always loved the charm of a hand-drawn image. No two artists will draw the same way. And no two drawings are gonna be exactly alike. Pitbull is a 2D animated short, which is something that's different from what Pixar normally does. Every frame is hand-drawn and hand-painted. And while we did draw on computers, everything was directly from the artist's hands onto the screen. And so that posed a lot of challenges early on, just trying to figure out how to tell the story with the resources within the studio, and then taking this 2D project and getting it to fit back into the normal 3D process at Pixar. We created our own pipeline. I worked with my director of photography, Arjun Rihan, 
who laid out all the shots. Layout is the phase in production where we place the camera and we figure out the staging and the framing for all of the shots. And so when he was done, we would take those shots and render them all out. And then those renders became the templates for our background painters. The animators were hand drawing the characters and they were on, you know, you could say a layer. And the backgrounds were all painted on a layer. And our compositor was able to stitch those two together. For the backgrounds, we opted for a mix between impressionistic, kind of loose, fast painting, but also still kind of grungy and gritty. The world of the short is in the Mission District in San Francisco. That's actually where Rosie first lived when she came to San Francisco. So it's a very special place for her. Because there's so much going on in the mission and there's so much to look at, for the main character, it's just this kitten who prefers to be alone. She uses a lot of the setting, like street signs and shadows to stay invisible. As far as the characters go, they're not overly detailed. The kitten is very cartoony and it's almost abstract in some ways. It was just so personally rewarding and, and fun just to draw the kitten. And I, I think for people who joined the crew later on as animators, they, they felt the same way. What's so rewarding is getting to see every single person on the crew come on and really have an impact Working with people and coming up with ideas and seeing this evolve into something more than if I were to just do it on my own was the most rewarding aspect of this whole process. I loved just working with people who I could trust and, and be blown away by. <laughs> okay. So you'll see they don't necessarily talk directly about the themes, but... The thing I thought was so cool was in the end when, oh, I can't remember the main animator, was it Rosie? Um, she talked about how the most meaningful part of the experience was in working with people she could trust. And so I see this promotion again of the idea that community and people and security with other people is so important. So I see that as being a part of her identity, right? So within her identity, our creator's identity, who I think her first name is Rosie, um, she values the impact and collaboration and safety of a trusted community. So I see it in her life. And then I see it emerge in Kitbull because we see how they are isolated in the beginning we see how they come out of their shells, you know, both of them in different ways. The pit bull is um, more injured through, the, through an experience of dog fighting, but the kitten has to overcome their fears and he, you know, the pit bull gains the kitten's trust. So we see them evolving, but they come together in their own little community and then they escape and they join a bigger community in being accepted within a family. So we see how important family and security are to our creator. I think that's so cool how we see it pop up in her words, and then through inference, we see it in the animated short as well. That's what I saw. I don't. I hope you saw that too um, in the animated short. Um, and oh, the other thing that was so cool. So I feel like um, filmmakers. You know, it's a lot easier to think about film and animated short as craft, right? You know, angling of the camera, and you know. Uh, how close do you zoom in? Is it a burial, panoramic, whatever, all those things. But those same elements are present in writing as well. All of those like directorial choices, they're present in writing as well. And that's what I mean by those elements of craft, right? So we might think about an author like a director and a director is going to choose particular scenes and how to angle them and how to portray a character. Um, I see those same elements in writing as well. And it's just so cool to see it visually because it's like, I feel like it's so impactful when I see it visually. And if I can translate that idea to how I read something, it just becomes incredible, like an incredible experience to realize that there are so many choices of craft that go into writing. Okay, little tangent. Um, and that is probably why I became, at least part of it, why I became an English teacher because it is just so cool. And I hope everybody can see it gets to see that cool too. Okay, so that's that. And this is this is it really. So feel free to use Kipple for this particular uh, author's purpose assignment. 
Um, it really works so well with, um, I feel like with this assignment, because there's so much there. And um, feel free to use Cyrano de Bergerac or any other of the readings to um, do the same thing. Think about, okay, so we would, mental steps really are, um, what theme do I see emerging in the piece? How does that theme or how do those themes speak to value systems? So what value systems do, does our author reveal? Because that's gonna tie into identity. Okay, I hope that helps. And I know this is kind of like an abstract concept. So I really appreciate you tracking with me and working through it with me. That's it. So I'm gonna stop my screen share. And I'm gonna stop.